Hey, what's the story? I'm recovering mid-2000s emo, Sean Shonson. So you may or may not be aware, but we have a TV channel here in Ireland that's dedicated to the Irish language called TG4, or Asgeilga TG Cahar. Oh, that's the good stuff. That little jingle right there. Love it. Now, growing up, I used to watch the shows on TG4 quite a bit. I can't really speak the Irish language, but I didn't know enough to get by. And honestly, whether you spoke Irish or you spoke English, the content on TG4, it was worth tuning into regardless. Krunus was class, lads. Like, what's even going on here? This is fucking weird. This is good weird. Now, one of the fondest memories I have of watching TG4 when I was younger was a little show called Hudi TNT. Hudi TNT was a live studio show for kids starring a troll called Hudi. This aired every Sunday in TG4 from probably around the mid-90s up until some point in the mid-2000s. And in this show, kids would be able to call up using a landline and actually play games live on television using their phone. So if you could imagine playing a platformer, but just trying to control the character by pressing like four and six. Yeah, crazy. There was really nothing else like it on TV at the time. And whenever it was on, I would always make sure to tune in and catch it. I didn't necessarily understand the language half the time, but I mean, it was good TV. I couldn't get enough of it. Now, unfortunately, in spite of me trying my hardest to find some, there is practically no footage of UDTNT on the internet from what I can tell. Very recently, someone actually did upload some footage of the show, which at the very least proves that it was real and I'm not just losing my mind. But the footage here is pretty poor, so it's not really going to do for any sort of decent content, unfortunately. So what's stranger about this is that Hudi kind of became a national sensation in Ireland. He was so popular at one point that they gave him his own Christmas song. Well, while I'm Santa, I've got to give him my Christmas list. Every time I go for a climb up there, I'm hoping just to see his face. And not only was he popular enough to get a single Christmas song, but he got two Christmas songs. What'd you get for Bono? Oh, what'd you get for Bono, Mom? A crown, he thinks he's king. And can't we buy zone? And can't we buy zone? A boo girl who can sing. <laughs> what you get for Bertie? What you get for Bertie? Shirts and ties galore. And can't we Clinton? Can't we Clinton? A look for his office door. <laughs> You know you've really made it in Ireland when you've got two Christmas songs. That's like the top barometer. Like a gaff and a Christmas song. That's how you've made it. Hudi also pretty much became the mascot for all of the kids programming on TG4 as well. There used to be a kids block that was called Kula 4 and Hudi would pop up all the time chatting away. And not only that, but Hudi also managed to win Irish Media Personality of the Year in the year 2000 and in the year 2004. He beat real people. Now, unfortunately, like I said, I have no decent footage of this show on Irish television, so I don't really have much of a means to show you the games that were played. But fear not. While Hudi was a bit of a national icon in our country, across Europe and most of the world, Hugo, as he's more commonly known, is a fucking megastar. Hugo the Troll is the brainchild of a Danish company called Interactive Television Entertainment, or ITE for short. Now, as the name implies, they were focused on creating games that could be interacted with through your TV at home. So they created not just the Yugo games, but the custom hardware that allowed people to play these games at home. Now, this was done by converting the signal from their landline telephones into inputs. And it's insane how ahead of its time this was looking back. And it actually worked really well, too. Hugo was a hit immediately in his home country of Denmark, but his popularity did not end there. As you already know, Hugo made his way over to Ireland, but Hugo actually aired in over 40 different countries around the world. The show could be easily tailored to new markets, so he became a bit of an international sensation. Apparently, Hugo even aired over in China where he was just known as European Troll. 
And as you can imagine, since Yugo was a popular show about playing games through the TV, it was only a matter of time before Yugo made his way over to home consoles as well. And that he did. So now we're going to check out some of Yugo's output on the PS1, starting with a collection of the mini games that was ported over from the TV series, simply named Hugo. And if you think that mini games designed in the early 90s to be played through a landline telephone would have lost their luster being ported over to the PS1, well, don't worry, you're absolutely right. So those games you've seen people playing on the TV through the phones, well, they were popular enough to be ported onto home computers and then popular enough again to warrant pouring those over to the PS1. The game starts out with a brief cutscene outlining the plot and introducing Hugo's wife, Yugolina, and their kids, Trollery, Trollerat, and Trolleroo. The narrator here is trying his best to make some troll puns, but he just ends up saying troll really weird. Hugo the Troll and his wife, Yugolina, were relaxing, for they had been trolling around all day. Anyway, Hugo's family gets kidnapped by the evil with Scylla, and Hugo has to set off on an adventure to save them. And we do this by playing a series of mini games. Now, once again, keep in mind that this is a port of some games that were designed to be played through a telephone while being watched on live television. So, as you could imagine, the games would have to be very simple to be anywhere near playable with a control method so unusual. And oh boy, simple they are. So, we have a map screen that allows you to follow a simple path towards the top, but we're just going to go through each mini game until the end. First up is Forest. Okay now, no time to lose. Let's get this game started. <laughs> what are we doing up here? I think I'll hang around. Alright, so, uh, few things. Since you are meant to be watching this game being played live on TV, Hugo has a few tricks up his sleeve to try to keep it entertained. Whenever you die, for instance, which you will, a lot, you get a death cutscene. Here's where you get to experience some of Hugo's classic one-liners. Oh no! What a flat feeling! And after each death, Hugo likes to knock on your TV to give you some motivation as well. Wake up! This is your last chance! It's probably not going to get annoying at all. Right, so the forest minigame, it's, uh, it's something, alright. You're automatically walking to the right and you've got two inputs, a jump and a crouch button. You duck to avoid the branches and you jump to avoid the traps on the ground. There's also bags you can collect which increase your score and that's it. That's the game. Just keep on walking, slowly walking, walking to the right. You go staring endlessly into your soul. It's probably also worth noting that this game doesn't have music in most sections, it's just ambient background noise, so this here is pretty much the, the full experience. So anyway, after carefully dodging traps for what felt like an eternity, that was only roughly two minutes, something happened. The level is now a little spookier and has thunder and ominous drones in the background. This game had a big Dolby surround certification thing at the beginning by the way and all the effort here is used into that thunder, money well spent. So the level is now spookier but the only change is there is now boulders to jump over and it's, it's done. Alright, that only took about 4 minutes. It felt like an eternity and it was awful but it's done. We made it! Well done! Alright, next up is Lumberjack. This game is incredibly simple, but it's by far the hardest minigame in the collection. You just gotta jump from log to log, which sounds pretty straightforward, but if you stand on one log for too long, it will sink. You also have to avoid branches on the side of the levels and avoid jumping into the water, which will probably happen to you a lot with the way Hugo likes to jump from side to side. It's just really boring, but it's also kind of difficult as well, which kind of just makes it unfun. The way the logs move, you can end up jumping on a specific log at the wrong time, and there's nothing really you can do. If your timing was off, you'll just, you'll just end up dying. Once again, there's also no music here, but we get more Yugo deck cutscenes, so that's something, I guess. Where's my diving gear? Trollery, trollerat, trolleroot, this game is kaput. It did take me a few tries, but this one here does only take about four minutes to beat as well.
We made it! Well done! Right, so moving on, the next game here is called Scuba. Yeah, it's just more dodging left to right, but to freshen things up, now you also have to move up to refill your air meter from time to time. This is another pretty difficult one, there's lots of stuff about coming at you and to your left and to your right, which means more deaths, which means a whole lot more death scenes. Do you think I'm a sandworm? You've also got to turn every now and then to avoid getting lost, so this one is a little more involved. It's still really boring and basic and only takes about 4 minutes to beat. And once again, we've no music here, so the game just kind of sounds really eerie at this point. We made it! Well done! I don't even know how I'm only 12 minutes into this game. It feels like I've been playing this way, way longer already. Alright, let's give Train a go. I remember this one from the TV show. On paper, this is one of the better minigames because it does actually require you to keep track of the tracks on the right side of the screen so you can kind of plan ahead so that you don't get hit by any oncoming trains. But then when I played it, I had to dodge a grand total of two things and the rest of the level was just moving slowly in a straight line for three minutes and then you win. Do you ever feel like you're just, you're just wasting your life? We made it! Well done! Alright, skateboards. Skateboards make everything better. Surely this has to be an improvement. Yo, let's go skate! Okay, it's, it's not good, but it's an improvement. This level kind of plays like the bonus stages in Sonic 2 where you just move side to side using the momentum to carry you up and down. It's not too hard, I had a few death scenes which means some more death scenes at least. Use your fingers out there! Alright, you go keep it PG for the kids, pal. And this level actually has music, finally! Putting that Dolby surround sound to good use. Still, not a good mini game, but definitely far and away the best one we played so far. You are so cool! We made it! Alright, so next up is Mountain. Hopefully, we can continue to see an upswing with the mini games going forward. Oh no, you go, no. So mountain is incredibly simple. You jump over gaps and sometimes you jump out onto panels on the left to dodge boulders. Once you manage to get the timing down to jump onto the panels, this one is incredibly easy. You sometimes do have to press the square button to use a grappling hook to move further up the mountain. Each time we get some hip life advice from Hugo as well. It's cool to be nice. and sound with two feet on the ground. We made it! And yeah, we beat it. This one only took about two minutes. Next. All right, Hugo's in an airplane now. This was probably my favorite of the bunch. You gotta fly a plane around that has limited fuel while trying to get as much points as you can before flying over the mountain so you can drop out. It controls pretty well and is definitely one of the more appealing games visually as well. You even have a little map which you could bring up to check which direction you're going. I'd imagine playing this game over the phone would be a little more difficult than most. But this here is another really easy game. You just fly over the mountain and dodge the red balloons and lightning and you're, you're done. We made it! Well done! This one also only took about 3 minutes. So we are now roughly 20 minutes into the game, and guess what? We're at the final level already. The final level is called Rope End and it starts here with just a little cutscene. You will never be free! Hugo can't beat me! Oh no, she's gonna be all weird, isn't she? I'm watching you, Hugo's little helper! Ah, oh, she's being real weird. Hugo will never have Hugo Lena back. She's mine. 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 <laughs> Help us, Hugo. Help us. 
I think this could be dangerous. <laughs> oh, this game's so fucking weird, man. So the game starts anyway, and there are three ropes in front of me. I guess I'll go ahead and pick the first one. Hooray! We're free! All right, we did it. So that was Hugo for the PlayStation 1, a fun novelty if you're into the TV show, but as a video game, what a load of shy. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. It was terrible to play through, but I suppose it was still fun to revisit something from my childhood, which is kind of fun. I mean, it's not like Hugo was so popular that he would actually manage to get another game on the PlayStation, would he? Hugo 2. When watching the TV show, I specifically remember there being more minigames present than what showed up in the first game. Well, most of the missing games showed up here in the sequel. I believe that Yugo 1 and Yugo 2 were both just ports of the Amiga version, so it makes sense that this would just come out shortly after the first game did. Which it did, roughly four months later in 1999. So what did four months of development time bring us? Well, it's the same game, but a little better. There is a story here once again, but it's pretty much the exact same as last time. Immediately after Yugo rescued his family and flew away in his plane, Scylla summons a cloud that steals Yugolina and wrecks Yugo's plane. So now Yugo has to go rescue his stranded children and wife again, literally minutes after he did it last time. What a life. So it's the same formula again, a series of minigames originally intended to be played by phone adapted to the PlayStation, so let's just breeze through this as painlessly as possible. So the first game is snowboarding. Oh, I just love the winter. Everything is so quiet and peaceful. Only me and my snowboard. <laughs> well, the spooky organ is back and now you've got to escape an avalanche while dodging snowboarders and crashing into a beaver's gaff. <laughs> This one isn't actually too bad, every now and then you've got to choose between two paths going forward. You can stop to open a map that lets you see the correct path to take. Now if you take too long though, the avalanche will catch up and kill you. I think I'm going to be the coolest troll in the world, all thanks to you! This one's actually fine, I mean there's not a lot of substance to it, but it does control pretty well, and guess what, there's actually music here this time as well. <laughs> Finally putting that Dolby surround sound to good work with this generic soundtrack. To be fair, I would take anything over the eerie silence of the last game, so it's a huge improvement overall. Even the death animations are a little bit better in this game. Although you still gotta get used to you go knocking on your screen every time you die. So yeah, not bad. The first mini game is actually pretty playable. Once we've beaten this one, we move on to the sled. Come on! The sledge is ready and winter's not forever! Oh, that bass. Alright, so funky bass music regardless, this game is, is pretty shit. You've got to push your sled down a hill to pick up momentum and then try to dodge stuff as you move on. You're moving so fast though, it's pretty much just luck whether you'll hit something or not. I did manage to fumble my way through this one eventually, but I was just holding forward the entire time and just praying I would dodge anything while I was going. It's not very fun, but hey, it's got nice bass though at least. Be cool now, we're in the grip of winter! After completing that, we move on to the ice cavern. I fucking hated this one, there's not much skill to it. The gimmick is that every time you jump onto a new spot, the platforms will fall and rise. It is seemingly random though, I couldn't discern any sort of pattern to it whatsoever. If you do stand in one spot for too long, you'll get hit by an object, and if you're not paying attention while moving, you could very easily just fall right off the level as well. As long as you never stop moving though, you should be fine, but as well as that, you also gotta get a bunch of items that spawn randomly over time. Once you've collected three of these signs, you can move to the door and input the signs to unlock the door. It took me about six minutes of just bouncing around aimlessly, waiting for the items to pop up on a pathway that I could travel across. It's not that difficult, it's just pretty boring and pretty tedious. Anyway, moving on. We did it! Thanks to your big memory chip! 
Next up, we have the minecart level. This one isn't too bad, it's pretty similar to the snowboard game where you just need to use the map to plan out a pathway so you don't come across any dead ends. You've also got to duck and dodge hazards coming from above and to the sides. The controls here do work well enough and the scaling effect looks pretty nice as well. Also the song for this level is way better than it has any right to be. Finally, at least this game has some decent music. It really does make the levels a whole lot more fun. Minecart was easy enough to get through anyway. This leads us on to the next game, and the worst one so far, The Swamp. Somebody. So this is a little platforming style level, only if you could imagine trying to platform using a telephone in the 90s. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not good. Your goal is to move across the screen to the right, avoid bats that are constantly chasing you, so if you do stand still for too long, you will die. You gotta try to jump over these mud hazards, which should be pretty easy, but the way you have to do a jump in this game is really weird. If you just tap the jump button, you do a short hop, and if you hold the jump button, you also do a short hop. What you need to do is actually tap the jump button a ton to try to get a jump high enough to cross these things. It just feels really weird to try to gauge the distance for some of these jumps. While doing this, you've also got to use these windmills to throw you longer distances, which sometimes works. On top of this, you've also got to keep an eye out for these animal signs, because once you reach the end of the level, you've got to input a specific password, which is so fucking difficult to do with these bats constantly on your arse. It's just a case of running back and forth, struggling to get up to the buttons to hit the correct code, but eventually, you'll get there and you'll get through the level. We did it! Well done! Well, that was fucking dreadful. Moving on. We're getting close to the end now, but first we've got to make it through Cliffhanger. Up we go! Just don't lose your grip now, because we may fall! This one isn't too bad. It's fairly simple. you just got to make it up to the top of the cliff, dodging hazards that pop out of the walls. The controls can feel a little stiff while climbing, but it's a massive improvement over the swamp level. The music for this area is also pretty good. The soundtrack for this game can be pretty hit or miss, but some of the music is, is pretty decent. I did die about 20 times trying to climb up this tiny little bit near the end, but we did manage to scrape through after all. Yeah, we made it! We're on top of the world now! With that level down, this leads us on to the final stage called Lightning Bolt. Scylla's key will be with me! Oh, twist my tail! She's cleaning the floor! Better keep off the clean spots! So, this is actually a proper game this time, not just a case of choosing the right piece of rope. Still not a good game though. This is kind of like the ice cave area, only here Scylla attacks the spots you're standing on and leaves a blue flame wherever you are standing. You just gotta keep moving non-stop until eventually a key spawns and then you can leave the area. It's not too hard, the timing can be very strict on Scylla's fire attack, but as long as you're always inputting a new direction when you land, you should be okay. So after about two minutes of jumping, a key spawned and then bam, you got your wife back. Probably not the best idea to take your family home on the plane again, Hugo, but sure, look, you do you. So is Hugo 2 better than Hugo 1? Well, it has higher highs and lower lows, but even though it only takes about 25 minutes, I would say it is overall the more cohesive game. Is it a good game, though? No, it's shy. Alright, so that's Hugo 1 and Hugo 2 done. And I guess since they were just porting over the Amiga games, it makes sense that they brought the two of them over together. I mean, it's not exactly like they're good games, but it is a nice time capsule, and it was a good way to be able to play these games that you've seen on the TV at home on a modern console. And now with nothing worthwhile left to port over from the Amiga, Hugo just disappeared from the PlayStation, never to be seen again. Hugo Tree. Quest for the Sunstones. So apparently Hugo's popularity in Europe managed to keep the series moving along on the PS1, but since there's now no more TV games to put over, what do ITE Media decide to do? Well, they make an actual game this time, that's what. Hugo Tree Quest for the Sunstones was released in the year 2000, and this time sees Hugo trying to stop Scylla and newcomer Don Croco, which is a great name for a character by the way, from unleashing a volcano on an island village of tiny natives. 
To do this, Hugo has to collect three sunstones, so he dons up in an Indiana Jones outfit, whip included, and sets out to get the stones. And yeah, this is a real video game this time. We got full levels, platforming, enemies, uh, that's about it. Now just because Yugo is appearing in a proper 3D platformer doesn't mean it's going to be a good game. Yugo 3 kind of plays like a Crash Bandicoot game, you'll come across a few different kinds of levels. Ones where you're running towards the screen, ones where you're side scrolling and ones where you're running away from something chasing you. You can collect gems which give you an extra life once you reach 100 of them or collect hearts to get an instant extra life. There's also a button to show and remove the UI which is a uh, welcome I guess. Other than that, it's just jump, dodge and whip things until you're done. It's genuinely one of the most basic platformers I've ever played. There is a level or two where you're in a minecart going down a slope in first person. That's kind of cool at first, but it does tend to drag on a little bit over the two levels and the control and hit detection in these sections can be a little bit janky. Although the perspective here is kind of cool since it does feel like an older Yugo minigame ported over onto 3D, which is nice. I will give the game a bit of credit though, as Yugo controls way better than he has any right to. The platforming in this game is generally really easy, but the ground and jump movement of Yugo is really responsive. It's a shame that the game is just so bland, the good control here is pretty much wasted. Also, this game seems to have lost the Dolby Surround Sound certification of the previous game, so I guess the developers just decided they weren't going to have any music in this game at all. Every single level in this game has no background music. You either get to hear ambient background noise or just Yugo's footsteps the entire way through the game. And look, I don't know if you've ever tried to play a platformer the entire way through without music, but it's, it's no crack. I'll show you a quick selection of what the game sounds like, just so you have an idea of what it's like to play. Also, this game released in the year 2000 doesn't even have a save feature. It's got no music and it's using passwords. What the fuck, Denmark? So I managed to beat the game in roughly around an hour. Just the sound of Hugo's footsteps for a good long hour. Time well spent. At the end of the game, once you have the three stones and after Scylla decides to get really weird again, Scylla, what's going on with your hand? Why are you gonna be so weird all the time? Stop! The last level is you outrunning the final boss, which is a tornado, I guess. Which is once again kinda eerie when you've no music. And then when you finish the level, you kinda just finish the game. and you're back at the title screen. That's it. So yeah, that was Hugo 3 Quest for the Sunstones, a competent but incredibly bland platformer for the PlayStation. Is it better than Hugo 2? Yes. Is it a good game? No, it's shite. Well look, we managed to get through three Hugo games on the PlayStation now, and it's pretty impressive. I mean, none of these games have been good, but Hugo did manage to actually get himself a trilogy on the PlayStation. Not a lot of characters can actually say they've done that, so I mean, fair play to him. He's gone far. And with that then we can finish up with Hugo on the PS1 because there's no way that he managed to get another. Hugo 4. Black Diamond Fever. So here's the thing, Hugo 4 is pretty much the same game as Hugo 3. It's got the same character models, the exact same controls, it's still lacking a save function. But fair play to them, they actually managed to make a much better game this time around. Black Diamond Fever is a direct follow-up to the story in the quest for the Sunstones. Scylla and Don Croco have this time kidnapped the whole native village and are now harvesting rare black diamonds from their island, as they are required to create a potion of pure evil. The story here is as bare bones as ever, but Sherlock, it doesn't need to be anything but that. They did add voice acting back into this one, and Hugo's new voice is a... Uh, it's a choice. I'm imprisoned in a cell, and unable to help my people... Oh no, there's absolutely no time to waste. Choices. So the game begins and if you played the last game, it will all feel very familiar to you very quickly. You're dressed the same, you've got your whip attack, you jump and you can crouch. 
What's different this time is that there is now a set number of gems per level, so instead of collecting 100 gems to get an extra life, now if you collect roughly 90% of the gems in a level, you get a permanent upgrade to your health. This is a nice change, honestly, it gives you some incentive to at least go out of your way to collect gems since it gives you a genuinely useful upgrade. In this game, you can rescue natives throughout the level as well. You rescue your poor trap friends by whipping them though? I never thought I'd see a kid's game where you whip slaves to free them, but... Sure, look, here we are. When you rescue a native, it acts as a checkpoint for the level, and you also get an extra life off them as well. The game is already pretty easy, but this means that you should have a ton of extra lives by the end of the game. The level design and overall challenge has taken a big step up compared to the last game. You visit more varied locations, and the platforming and levels are just better designed overall. Instead of the game following the Crash Bandicoot formula from last time, the levels kind of have a fixed camera that generally switches your field of view around a lot, so the levels do feel a bit more dynamic this time around. And I can't believe they got me with this dumb spider jump scare. The game also has music this time, which is just a huge improvement. I guess it's just the thing where the odd numbered Yugo games on PlayStation don't have music, but the even numbered ones do. I mean, the music here isn't exactly amazing, but it's fine for the game and even has some darker themes for some of the levels, like the oil rig or the diamond cavern theme. Now while the game has improved a lot, it still has a bunch of problems holding it back. The game overall is more fun to play through, but it is still an incredibly basic 3D platformer on the PlayStation, and the game's even shorter this time, taking easily under an hour to see the end credits. There's also no gimmick stages in this game, and there's only one stage where you're running away from something chasing you this time, so while the levels are generally better overall, the lack of content here is even more apparent this time around. This game also ran really poorly for me in some sections as well. There are some very noticeable frame drops and it was frequent enough throughout the game to be kind of bothersome. Now, I don't think the game is all that ugly visually to be honest, but a game this simple shouldn't be chugging like this. Now, I figured it could just be the emulator that I'm using, but I did check some gameplay from real hardware and it seems pretty consistent there too, unfortunately. Also, the new voice acting in this game is pretty terrible, but it is kind of at the stage where it's veering more towards the it's so bad it's good territory, so I guess it's an improvement overall. Empress, hmm, what do you think, Croco? Uh, By I... the way, how's that potion of mine coming along? Does it really have to take that long just for one single little drop? Madam, I assure you everything is proceeding according to plan. The fucking state of Don Croco in this game, what did they do to him? So at the end of the game, you rescue the native leader and play another final level that's just running away from the screen and then you're done. You get a fun little cutscene. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Useless, prehistoric, oh. reptiles, oh. 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 stupid, oh. Sorry. ugly, uh, oh. you would oh. never oh. do anything Sorry. right. Madam. Oh. oh, madam, this is terrible. Oh, ow. Oh. Choices. Actual credits this time and then bam, you're back to the start screen and it took only 45 minutes. Yeah. So that was Yugo 4, a much improved but still pretty bland platformer on the PlayStation. Is it better than Yugo 3? Yes, absolutely. Is it a bad video game? It's all right, it's okay. It's okay, it's an okay video game. Okay. So I guess it's pretty clear now that Yugo is here to stay, and I mean in fairness to ITE, it's pretty clear that they have actually managed to improve the formula every time they've attempted it, so I guess the logical conclusion here is that if they continue on with the platformer style of gameplay, it's only natural that the games will just get a bit better as they go on. So I for one am personally really looking forward to seeing what they're going to do next with the platforming series on the PS1. Frog Fighters? What the fuck is Frog Fighters? Oh, it's Frogger. I get it. So for their next game, ITE decided that the next logical step for Yugo in 2002 was a Frogger clone. A fucking bad one. So the only plot in this game is the opening cutscene, which shows some crocs stealing a frog, and then that's it, you're Frogger now, good luck. The game is pretty similar to the PS1 version of Frogger in that it features worlds with individual levels and puzzles to solve. Only here in Yugo, it's scaled down to just single screen levels. So the game functions okay, the only inputs are the four directions on your controller and each press makes you jump to one space. 
You gotta manage your timing and movement to overcome simple platforms and puzzles. It's just Frogger. It's just Troll Frogger. Your goal is to hop around the level collecting keys and frog boxes until the exit opens. You usually have to hop back and forth taking different routes each time until you're done. The levels can be really messy visually and it's not always exactly clear where you can hop to causing you to die a lot when you're trying to get the grips to the level for the first time. But if you do lose your four lives you just restart at the beginning of the current level so it's not too punishing to be fair. I mean the game is fine, it feels like a really low budget frogger clone but it's functional. That being said the game does only take 20 minutes to be. There's a total of four worlds with three levels each, and each level takes roughly two minutes to get through. It's insanely short. I know all of these games have been really short, but this one here is actually taking the piss. There's also three of these question mark levels which have this really weird music playing in the background. What the fuck is this? So at the end of the game you beat a level with this crocodile wearing a chef's hat, I guess he was going to eat the frog, I suppose. So you cage him up and then congratulations, roll credits. No end cutscene, nothing, you're done. 20 fucking minutes. So that was Yugo 5 Frog Fighters. I mean it functions, it only takes 20 minutes to beat, but I mean, they put music in it. Music in an odd numbered Yugo game on the PlayStation. Big moment. So is it a good game? No, just, just play Frogger. There's like 20 Frogger games. Just play any Frogger game. Any Frogger game. Well, not any Frogger game. Just most. Play Frogger. Just play Frogger. So after the steady improvement that we'd seen from Yugo 4, we take a bit of a tumble here with Yugo 5, unfortunately. I mean, at this stage, it's 2002. The next generation of consoles is already out. I mean, who was even buying Yugo games on the PS1 in 2002, let alone 2003? I mean, imagine releasing a Yugo game in 2003. Hugo 6, The Evil Mirror. Hugo's last game on the PS1 sees him return to the 3D platformer style of Hugo 3 and 4. Now this game supposedly came out in December of the year 2003, which is really, really late into the PlayStation 1's life cycle. This might even be the last 3D platformer ever released on the console. Imagine that. Fucking Hugo of all things. So the game starts off with a quick shout out for Hugonet.com, the birthplace of internet trolls. And holy shit, is that a load game option? They did it. The mad lads actually put saving into their game. It's not like they're ever really long enough to really need it, but still, it's a sign of progress. And we're into our usual opening cutscene. Scylla and Don Croco are scheming once again. We check in with Hugo and his family and I see the, uh, the bad voice acting. It's back again. Well, the pastry's about ready. All we need now is Hugolina with the wild berries. Well, I wonder how Scylla's gonna kidnap Hugo's family this time. I hope I'm not spoiling a nice family mood, am I? <laughs> Get out of my house, Scylla. You know you're not welcome. Oh, oh no! Daddy! Oh. Dear little troll. Oh, so clever. Caught in the mirror's embrace. You'll disappear without trace. Be gone for now. Be gone forever. Oh, daddy. Oh, that went dark real quick. So for a bit of a twist, you start this game playing as Hugo's children instead of Hugo himself. And not only that, but each of the kids have their own stage and you can play them in any order. It's not exactly groundbreaking, but it is a welcome change of pace. Each level houses a piece of the evil mirror that has Yugo trapped within, so we'll go through each level in order starting with Troller Root. In Troller Root's level you gotta try get a mirror piece back off some mobster beavers. This level cutscene gives us a brief introduction. Hi boss. Hello boss. Let me see what you got. Priceless treasures boss. <laughs> Just look at here. Yup, lovely stuff. Once we are into the game, it all starts to feel very familiar. It's definitely a little different than the previous Yugo platformers, but the gameplay here follows the same direction as before. This level feels like it's kind of going back towards the more Crash Bandicoot style of gameplay, and if that didn't give it away, Troller Root's attack surely will. 
The gems here work like they did in Yugo 4, where there's a set number per level, and getting around 90% of them in a level permanently increases your health. A change they made to gems in this game as well that I'm not really a fan of is these bags. Gems are stored within them, and when you hit into them, the gems pop out. Sometimes you end up running ahead of the gems, and sometimes the bags spawn gems behind you, so it just means you're often running backwards and forwards trying to collect everything. It would have just been better if they had left them floating around the level in my opinion, but uh, it's nothing really major, it's just a minor annoyance in this case. The other big difference in this game is that there is now a use key which lets you interact with objects. This is pretty much entirely used for these switches which block progression throughout the level. You will come across loads of these in each level and they add pretty much nothing to the gameplay outside of dragging out the length of each level just a little bit. Each character also has their own unique set of moves. Troll Root here can double jump and has the spin attack which we've seen before, but outside of that, it's just the same old Yugo gameplay. A new gimmick with the enemies here though is that they fucking love to make you run around in a circle after them. This is just great gameplay right here. The first level here with Troll Root is actually pretty long. It took me nearly 20 minutes to beat and actually had the first real boss fight out of any of these platforming games, so that's a positive sign. Sure, it was just turning switches over and over, but hey, it's progress once again. So the first level of this lasted about as long as the entirety of Frog Fighter, so that's not bad. Let's see what the baby's level is like. So Trollery is now hanging out with Vikings for some reason and is now facing them for a piece of the evil mirror. It's never really explained how the baby ended up here, but look, we'll, we'll go with it. So as a twist, this is a racing level. So yeah, now we're doing some wild boar racing against some Vikings and honestly it doesn't control that bad. You know, I've got to give props to ITE, they make some shitty gains, but at least the controls here are usually on point. So this level is pretty simple, you've just got to come first in three laps around a snowy track. There's no weapons, no real shortcuts, just hold, accelerate, collect as many gems as you can and you'll win with little or no effort. The whole three laps take around six minutes and by the second lap racing on this barren empty track, it just all gets pretty boring. So thankfully, it's not that long and it's over and done with pretty quickly. So with our second piece of the mirror collected, we move on to Troll the Rats level. We are now in a level with Roman Beavers. I don't really know what's going on with this stage to be honest, but the voice work, it's amazing as always. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. No. oh Emperor, it's awful. A troll, a dangerous troll with an enormous snowball cannon which can smash our great castle to smithereens and steal all our treasure. So we start at the level and whoa, holy shit, is that a bazooka? All right, now we're talking. The bazooka isn't actually that bad. It has infinite ammo and kind of locks onto enemies, so it's not that bad to use. Although, it does kind of have shit damage, but... Eh, it's still a snow bazooka. That's good. So this level is very similar to the first one. Once again, there's a lot of switches. A whole lot of switches. But there are also more enemies this time around. As we know, we can use the snow bazooka to hit them from afar, but it really is just quicker to hit them with the melee attack up close. Troller Rack can't double jump, but the platforming in this level is generally very easy anyway, so it's not much of an issue. The level kinda goes on for 12 minutes, and then at the end we get to fight another boss. Two bosses in a Yugo game were truly blessed. Although this boss's gimmick is just chasing around in a circle, so... I'm glad they managed to turn both switches and running a circle into a boss mechanic. So we beat the Roman Beavers and get our third piece of the mirror. Now with the mirror put back together, we unlock Yugo's levels. First up is Castle Clocks. Our boy is back and now he has a brand new moveset. He's lost the whip, but he has gained the ability to double jump, punch, and now even push blocks. He's a whole new fucking troll. So we get off to a great start anyway. Help. What the fuck is this? This first level is really bland and short. It lasts only about four minutes, but they managed to get a whole bunch of switch sections into it regardless. There's a Scylla boss at the end, but it's just you running back and forth hitting mirrors when they glow. It's mad easy, and it's done in only about 30 seconds. After that, we have Rainbow Towers. This is your customary run away from the big spooky enemy stage. The giant Scylla head chasing you is kind of cool, but this is probably the worst one of these they put in the game so far. Why are you putting switch sections into a fucking chase level? Who enjoys this? Anyway, it's over in about two and a half minutes, so moving on. Next up, we have the Evil Mirror Castle. This is just the same level as the first Yugo stage, but this time it has a couple of new enemies added on. Honestly, these Yugo levels kinda suck, lads. The, the castle location is just really bland, there's no fun platforming here. I guess at least there's only two switch sections in this entire stage, so that probably makes it the best level by default. 
There's also another syllabus here. You're just breaking mirrors again. Although this time you gotta shatter different sections of the mirror as they glow. It's better, but this entire level and the boss still only took about 3 minutes to beat. And with that, the three mirror levels are complete, and once you know it, we're on to the final boss. And this time, we actually get a proper final boss stage. It's, uh... It's just smashing mirrors that glow while a giant Scylla head floats around in the background. Only this time, they now make you chase the mirrors in a circle as well. The whole fight takes about a minute. So with that, we save Hugo from his fate trapped inside the Shadow Realm, and hopefully Don Croco can finally get some peace. Oh... You idiot! That is my left eye! Look what you're doing! Well, maybe not. So with that, we've managed to complete every single Yugo game on the PS1. I mean, it's not a good series of games, but there's some fun and some charm to be had, especially from the first two games, I would say. If you're going to play any of the platformers, I would probably recommend playing Hugo 4. Uh, but that being said, if I could give a recommendation, it would just be to not play any of them. You have better things to do with your life. Unlike me. So this is the end of the video. If you've never heard of Hudi or Hugo before, I hope you got to learn a little bit because it's a pretty interesting tale of technology and kids television. And I'm surprised, honestly, it's not talked about more today because it was really quite revolutionary for the time. If you did know about Hugo or Hudi, I hope you had a fun time revisiting the character. And don't worry, Hugo is still active today. He mostly just appears in slot machine and mobile games, but I guess that's a fitting path for Hugo to take. You kind of start live on TV over a landline phone and now you're mostly relegated to mobile games, so... Meh. You die as you live. And don't worry, there were tons of Hugo games released long after the PS1 as well, so... If there's ever an opportunity to make another video down the line... Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I don't know if I want to do that to myself again so soon. But anyway, thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like and subscribe. If you didn't enjoy the video, give me a thumbs down, leave me some criticism in the comments section. I'll probably definitely read it. I will have more videos out again soon in the future. If there's anything that you would like to see, please don't hesitate to leave some recommendations in the comments. But until then, thank you so, so much and bye, 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 bye.